Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Play Portal, the 1986 computer novel written by Rob Swigert. This is the Amiga version. I'm going to get us straight back into the action, if action is the right word, by clicking on Med 10 here. Um, if you would like to catch up with what on earth is going on in this story, then I suggest the, our playlist for uh, previous sessions of Sitting Down with Portal. But uh, a very brief summary would be that um, we're following the character of Peter DeVore, who's currently in Antarctica, which seems to be facing a, um, a very imminent uh, invasion by the, um, the global political force. He doesn't approve of, uh, of Peter or uh, the Antarctican people uh, by everything we've read. So nothing in those two categories there. Have a look at SciTech. No, I should jump us straight to a new entry if there was one, but there's nothing there. Um, I'm hoping this will this will be the time for military the military category to prove its worth. Oh, uh, uh, Terminus. There you go. Oh, we've got a, a tranche, a veritable tranche of historical documentation here. So, um, Ditmore Seminole Gad, also known as Mentor here, uh, uh, had some aphorisms uh, before he died. Um, and also, he was pointing Peter DeVore to the, uh, the fabled um, temperate zone in Antarctica called, called Terminus. Uh, where Peter's supposed to, to head in case of emergency. Um, so we've got these three things to read, which is exciting. What if we'll get, oh, I think we might have a picture even. Uh, picture. I, oh, can you tell what that is? It could look like some, like a roof of a house and some trees, possibly. Possibly. Okay. Historical cultural data link entry. Terminus stroke summary stroke A. Parentheses Erebus node. Terminus was cited in 2012 by Jules Sorel during the third Transantarctic Safari. That's such a strange phrase. Uh, he kept detailed notes. I mean, it's a desert. I know you don't really have a safari in the desert. I confuse myself now. He kept detailed notes and some old-fashioned still hollow records, now so fragmented that most resolution has been lost. In the dim computer-generated hollow images, Terminus looked like an ordinary, glacially carved dry valley, free of ice and snow. In the centre of the lowest point was what appeared to be a lake. Mean temperature, according to Sorel, is 15 degrees Celsius, parentheses 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Semicolon. Heat source unknown, but presumed to be geothermal. Terminus has never been detected from satellite or airship overflights, and its precise location is unknown. Reasons are unclear, but History AI speculates Terminus is shaded by ice overhang or significant rock outcroppings. Sorel claims he saw or planted, the meaning is unclear, modified beech and conifers, ferns, even grasses. This claim cannot be substantiated. Okay, just that's just the, the download really on what Terminus is supposed to be. And we'll load up the aphorisms of Mentor. Uh, I'm not going to read out that long string of numbers, but it, below it, that long string of numbers, it says historical cultural data link entry. The aphorisms of Mentor, parentheses, Double A Erebus node condensation report ref at one three two one in parentheses. Oh, it's going to list them. This is brilliant. These these are pearls of wisdom, folks. So, um, pay attention. Number one, brain is the bed. Mind is the sleeper. Number two, when the sleeper awakes, the eye must open. Number three. When the sleeper's eye opens, she leaves the bed. Number four. To knit, one must first shear. Number five. 
Falling can't hurt. Now landing, that's a different matter. <laughs> is, hang on, is this, uh, are these his, like, condensed wisdom? Or is this his, uh, is this his stand-up set? I can't tell. Okay. Now landing, that's a different matter. One must know how to land. Okay. Number six. The sleeper dreams the universe. What will happen when he awakens? Number seven. Matter is the pattern mind makes. Number eight. Mind, consciousness, awareness, spirit, thought, perception, feeling, memory, imagination, and intention. These are the fragments that delude us. Nine. Mind is a local phenomenon. Ten. There is a reason we close the eyes of the dead. Number eleven. When we see a ring around the moon, the eye is open. Number twelve. The eye is the door through which the material universe enters. How, then, does it leave? Through the bottom, I think. I think that's how it works. Well, that was, that was nice. I, as much as I am taking the mickey out of um, uh, the self-importance of some of this writing, um, I do enjoy the 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 way this structure of story um, offers um, some uh, some detailed world building. Really, um, we do get to fill in a lot of the details, which I, I appreciate. I appreciate all the effort taken and the um, the imagination to do it as well. Okay, we didn't look at the picture for the aphorisms. I'll go back and check that before we leave this section. So this is our historical cultural data link entry terminus stroke summary stroke B parentheses Erebus node. So I guess a further update on what we had read before. Terminus would have to be located within this region, since the route of the third transantarctic safari was inaccurately documented, since it was done on foot and without modern tracking satellites. Of course, because it was 2012. Antarctic government has mounted seven expeditions in the past 65 years to look for terminus. All were unsuccessful. Much of the continent remains unexplored. We possess partial records of the seven expeditions. Oh, well, that's going to be a new set of entries, isn't it? Or uh, maybe not straight away? Let's see. No, well, that's history done. So... Oh, I guess it'd be geography, maybe, that the seven expeditions would be in? Oh, you know what? I completely forgot what I just said. That we'd go and check the aphorisms picture. So, bear with me a moment. I do luckily have a cup of tea for, for loading moments, so I can... It's a good... Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a game if you want to uh, read it out a lot. It's a let's play. Um, but the loading time offers some, some tea drinking opportunities, which I appreciate. Um... Oh no, it's just a corrupted home. I thought we might get uh, something more interesting there. Oh, well. worth checking. Now, military. This is this is your time, military. Let's hack into the uh, the world world net military database sure that's that's fine um so yeah we do we have ln uh dash apc mil spec what that means i haven't the foggiest we're accessing the data crystal oh we get an image we get this that looks like some kind of battle craft or robot doesn't it okay this is the LN APC mil spec. L, 20 meters. W, 8 meters. H, 4 meters. So I assume that's length, width, and height. Seating capacity, 180 with full combat gear. Oh, so is combat gear so substantial that it would reduce the number of people you could fit in a craft? Powertrain, liquid nitrogen suspensor, heavy. Guidance, mark. 26 LFR, mod 87 ComComp AI, full image hollow projection with redundancies. Oh no, there's even redundancies here. Facilities, rotational sleeping, six washroom closets. I 
think that means toilet. Gallery and mess delivery. Parentheses cap 45. Isometric conditioning fields. Edmod and recreation projectors. Individual. Oh, nice. It's got like in flight entertainment. Lovely. So, rotational sleeping suggests there aren't enough uh, berths for everybody who's travelling. There's 180 berths, which would be rather a lot. Six And six bathrooms for 180 people. I don't know. I um, It's not the life for me, I don't think. Okay, so there was nothing else going on there. So, we're going to have a scene set on that, aren't we? I think, I think that's the only reason we will have been introduced to that information. Right, now we're back to life support, so we're going to have to crack on with our list of uh, minor characters. So I believe last time we, uh, the last entry we checked was for Rover Hicks. So now we're on to Scotty Coston. Okay, Scotty Coston, assigned male, uh, born on the 17th of July 2059 in Springfield. So that suggests that's one of Peter's crew. Let's quickly work through these as quick as we're able. Uh, so this is going to be the blood pressure graph. This is the temperature. Okay. Um, we're going to see uh, respiratory and GSR represented like this. And then we're going to see a graph for heart rates and EEG. Here we go. Momently, there it is. And then attention is like that. DNA and hormones are charted thusly. Neurotransmitters have been measured and depicted like this. And finally, glycogen M is displayed this way. There you go. All right, so we're up to Scotty when I come back to the relevant categories. But geography is kind of where I'm thinking we'll find some more on Antarctica and the, ex and the expeditions there. Great Polar Desert. Yeah, there you go. Oh, we get, I think we've got an image. Oh, there you go, like a cross-sectional uh, depiction there. Very nice. Okay, geographic database. McMurdo C, twin, oh, circa 2075, parentheses, geograph 2075, stroke double A, stroke epsilon 22, and parentheses. A topographic simulation of the Great Polar Desert. The ice layer has been removed, revealing the bedrock underneath. In places, the ice layer was up to two miles thick. Terminus presumed to be located somewhere within this area. Parentheses, 5,000 kilometres squared. That's qu quite a large area to have to search through if, um, if Peter's not really sure where to head. Um, right, well that's all we get in geography for now, apparently. I think we, yeah, we might have teed up as much as the story's going to let us um, before divulging a little chunk of story. Uh, let's go back to Scotty Coston here. In Wasatch. Um, so we can have a look at Scotty's family tree. Okay, we've got Katie Williams and Henry Williams, who uh, give birth to Trixie Coston, and then Trixie Coston gets together with David Coston, and they produce Scotty Coston. David Coston's parents were Paula and to James Coston. There you go. Physiology and ESP. Okay, uh, that's that chart, and then. Some basic core IQ categories have been assessed and found thus. There we go. Um, so we go back to the main menu. 
and we will head off to psychology, so more of Scotty Costin's vital statistics. That, that I overshot there, Scotty Costin. Uh, emotional evaluation. Personal growth chart. and uh, evaluation of some further basic core IQ categories. Those, there you go. Thanks, Scotty. Central processing. Oh, okay, got a central processing thing as well. Upload military file, L, Dash four three eight seven six stroke A. Let's read that. Oh, this one's got an image as well. Let's have a look. There you go. Yeah, it's like the um, under under ice base, probably. Okay. Re Hoskins, Captain. ENC, date of AEF action. Hollow Proj. Erebus cutaway view. Note to central shaft, heat exchanger in central magma chamber. 17 active volcanoes worldwide maintained heat exchange technology for local power requirements. Erebus, parentheses, we now find, dash CP, in parentheses, had the most efficient, maintaining an overall level of more than 76% energy utilised. Graphic recorded via Geosync L-43876-A, downloaded from military archiving, Stroke retrieval systems. Okay, I, d I don't know that uh, imparted much, but that's fine. Um, all right, uh, we'll read the last set of stats for Scotty, and then we'll see what Homer has for us. Scotty Austin. Okay, so we uh, will finish off the last basic core IQ uh, selection. There we are, that's those. Um, the logic evaluation is given like this. Uh, memory has been assessed this way. And the social adjustment is described in this map. There we go. All right, I'll have one last sip of tea as home is loading up and then uh, I'll get ready to to launch into some prose. Oh, okay, two narrative two chunks. So Peter Devore one. Uh, to start with in a Regent Sable one afterwards, I believe. Interesting. Both sides of the conflict. The ant computers spun some of Mentor's aphorisms past Peter. Peter asked for information about Terminus 2. They showed a dim hollow image of what looked like an ordinary dry valley. A glacial carved valley free of ice and snow. In the centre of the lowest point was what appeared to be a lake. But whether it was melted water or ice was not clear. Thank you, Peter said. And now, recent messages from Mentor's virus watchers, relation to power, terawatt range. We have initiated the search, Peter Devore. It may take some time. Very well, call me when you find something. Okay, so... Peter doing a database search? I'm not sure that necessarily required a scene. Okay, Regent Sable, what are you up to? The ballistic transports fell silently toward McMurdo. The first audible warning was the whistle of heated air as they hit the atmosphere. It was early winter, and the darkness was complete. 
Deep in the moving ice, the ant burrows were busy. But there was no one on top when the transports curved into a landing at the launch facility on the ice. They came in under cover of atmospherics, wild fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field and the aurora in the polar regions, which interfered with normal electromagnetic communications. It wasn't perfect cover, since the ants had sophisticated means of talking to one another or detecting intruders, but it hampered their efforts. McMurdo was undefended. The huge transports landed on their suspensor fields on the ice one after another. As soon as they stopped, the cargo doors swung open, and ENC troops spilled out onto the ice, where they formed in tight ranks, facing Ross Island, where Mount Erebus loomed in the darkness. They were equipped with visual amplifiers, which gave a full-colour daylight cast to the scene. Yet because the skies were low and cloudy, threateningly, threatening a storm just now from the unpredictable Antarctic weather, the scene also had an eerie, sickly blue-green false colour cast. Regent was the first one off. He waited impatiently as the troops formed up. The second transport landed, and the third, and the fourth. Over the whistle of air and the low hum of the fields were other sounds. Groans at creeks, thumps and crackling, and screaming. Regent paced nervously, smacking his hands together against the cold. The first regiment formed up, high-powered neurophage weapons at the ready, their power packs winking full-charge lights. Because military weapons were not tailored to the individual user, they had to be more powerful and general in their effects. So they were large, ugly weapons. Sergeant Dent and Hoskins, now a captain, approached Sable, their boots crackling on frozen snow. Already protector. Hoskins said. All right, take this team and move out. You know what to do. I want them alive. Mentor, Devore, the others. I don't want yams, Captain. It's essential they be unharmed. We understand, sir. We'll find them. Kind of spooky, isn't it? Sable looked around. Spooky? Yes, I guess it is. There's no sign of anyone around. No sign of resistance. The surface buildings look locked and deserted. But they're here, Hoskins, under the ice. I was thinking of the sound, sir. Sable grunted and gestured them away. Liquid nitrogen surface transports filled rapidly with troops, and the convoy started off, a line of the sullen grey vehicles gliding noiselessly above the surface. In the command vehicle, Captain Hoskins stared into the hollow projections of the volcano. The central magma chamber glowed red. Down through the core plunged a dark blue cylinder. The heat exchanger. Hoskins told Dens. They power the goddamn place from the volcano. What about the ice? Dens asked. There's not much we can do about the damned ice, Dens. The stuff moves ten metres a month toward the ocean. The ants burrow in it, live down there, carry it along, eventually it carves off as icebergs, but until then they just use it. They're constantly tunnelling inland as they move out, as the outside moves. We don't have any decent schematics. Hell, it changes all the time anyway. So it's a good thing we're not the ones who have to go down there. He tapped his finger through the projection. Rotate, he commanded. The south southeastern flank turned toward them. Here, he pointed. This is where Psyche is. Permanent laser cut. Seven levels, 12,000 people in there. Snug as bugs. We got 800 crack troops we can manage. We get in here. He indicated again the elevator access. The groaning sounds grew louder. A light hard snow hit the field over the vehicle and hissed into steam. Suddenly they rocked before a blast of wind. Not good, Dens muttered. The snow raced horizontally across their path. The air was filled with frozen vapour, which whipped away as soon as it formed. Hoskins turned on the low-frequency radar and signalled the others behind him to connect. The convoy moved on through the beginnings of a great winter storm. Ooh, okay. Well, that uh, at least gets the um, the antagonists to the location of uh, narrative progress, so that's good. 
Have we uh, unlocked any other little nuggets along the way? No, we haven't. That's uh, unfortunate. We have had a lot of stories by this point, though, so that's, that's something. All right, we... Um, yeah, that was a slightly longer round than usual, wasn't it? But let's let's have a whip, whip through again and see what we can find. Nothing in Med 10. Nothing in Scything. Scitech, maybe? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, maybe more history then, if we uh, go from history to geography. If we go back to history again, maybe we'll know more about these expeditions that were brought to our attention. No, we won't. Okay, curious. Uh, military then, if we're, if we're heading into uh, an invasion situation. No. Well, that's curious. So we're back to uh, another character's stats then. So. Um, we will want uh, Beth Rain Heard. So Beth Rain Heard, assigned female, born the 13th of October 2055 in Springfield, and has a blood pressure chart like this. And then has a graph for temperature that looks a bit like this. And then uh, respiratory and GSR is here. Heart rate and EEG. Like this. Tension is going to pop up just here. Oh, I accidentally clicked on tension in there. Um, so that's that chart, and then DNA and hormones, like this, uh, neurotransmitters, there you go, two uh, opposing uh, lines there on the, that chart, and then glycogen M, there we go, that's all those ones. Lovely, we will uh, then head to the next category, which I think is Geography. I uh, hope there's a little nugget or something. There's be either have to be Geography or Central Processing, won't it? In order to move things on a bit. Okay, McMurdo Weather. Yeah, something. Do we get a uh, an image? No, we get a pixelated Homer. This is all very uh, uppercase, isn't it? Geographic database text information but murder weather. Parentheses Antarctica date AEF. In parentheses, heavy snow, high winds. Temperature low, minus fifty four degrees Celsius. High minus thirty nine degrees Celsius. Wind northwest at one hundred and twenty kilometers per hour. Changeable. This weather was not forecast. Repeat, this weather was not forecast. Bright indications suggested moderate winds, no precipitation. Okay, so is that supposed to be the weather report from the day of the invasion? I, I take it, would otherwise um, it doesn't seem to have wouldn't seem to have a lot of relevance. And that's that's all we get there, okay. Uh, Wasatch. We'll find Beth Rain here. Okay. Alright, let's have a look at Beth Rain's uh, 
family tree. Okay, so we've got uh, Nancy Hurd and Arnold Hurd uh, having the child Jules Hurd, um, who is one of the parents of Beth Rain. And then Beth Rain's other parent is Belinda Hurd, who is descended from Edward Mantle and Mel Mantle. Physi physiology and ESP um, is recorded this way. The basic core IQ is. Is this? There we go. All right, and then we're heading off to psychology. Uh, there you are, Beth Rain. Okay, emotional chart is like that, and personal growth. It's going to look like this. Basic core IQ, at least the categories that are in this section of the database are those ones, even across the board. Okay, central processing. Do you have anything for us to, to drive this thing forward? Do gravitation detector ref 349520. Is this Wonder on the spaceship again? Oh, we've got a, there you go, quite a little star chart, I think. ISAT graviton detector data. Transmission query dated 6th of July 2078, 1544 hours Zulu. File crystal hollow. The anomaly so called, determined to be unusual event horizon, direction of Vega 19 plus LY out, possible black hole, high axion and energy flux in vicinity. Okay, so this black hole with high axion and energy flux in vicinity. Uh, is that going to have the power to pull off the uh, the... The technology that we've been told can't possibly be powered? Well, so let's check the date. So this is from 2078, and we, we the player, kind of the astronaut who's discovering the story, is in 2106. So yeah, that's the past still. And that's that one. One of those two things might be enough to unlock our last little chunk of story for today. Go and add mod and we will um, just close up looking at the statistics for Beth Rain. Uh, let's go um, anti-clockwise from the bottom, why not? Let's, let's subvert, the, subvert the system. Um, so social adjustment has been uh, assessed and found to be thus. Uh, Beth Rain's memory has been uh, enumerated and is displayed in this chart. Basic Core IQ has further been assessed in the following categories. There we are. And Logic is depicted in this graph. All right, well, let's try home and see if we have, in fact, unlocked something. Yeah, something, a Peter Devore entry. Let's do it. Salt cycle transports approaching from the northwest. The computers told Peter. Estimated arrival, 16 minutes. Thank you, Peter said. Give me ISAT visuals. Abruptly, a new image replaced the flowing alphanumerics. What is it? The shape twisted like smoke into itself, shaded in greys and dark blues and deep shadow. Bright streamers flowed outward. Gradually, Peter could discern a tangible shape, a sphere coupled with a disc. It has been named the anomaly. The computer answered. Size? Less than one solar diameter. Distance? 19.643 light years. Direction? Vega. Vega? Did you say Vega? 
Yes, is that significant? I don't know. The first transports are landing on the ice. Estimate landing forces arrival at McMurdo, 4 hours 17 minutes. Notify the others, Peter said. He made his way to his living quarters and looked at all he had accumulated in the short time he'd been here. The clothing, the hollow crystals and data chips. The handcrafted artworks. In this brief time, he thought, he'd grown attached to the place. The others were already gathered in the refectory. ENC has landed on the ice, he said. They'll be here soon. We all know the strategy. Originally we'd, we'd be in on it. Something's come up, though. And we'll be leaving. Driven out? Ah, oh, Shem. Always angry? Yes, we're being driven out. They drove us out of the Northwest Alliance. They chase us down here to the pole. Where is there left to go? Thatcher moved quietly to the front of the room and whispered something to Peter, who frowned and shook his head. We'd have to go anyhow, he said distinctly. Thatcher shrugged. It's your show, he said. OK, I'll tell them. Listen. There are a lot more transports coming in than anticipated. We can't move until they're all down, and meanwhile troops are already on their way. We may have more of a fight than we anticipated. Should we stay to help, or should we go now, as mental urged? There are no guarantees we'll find where we're going. There are no guarantees we'll survive here, either. Some of us could end up yams, or worse. Go, Laren shouted. That's what we're supposed to do. This isn't our fight. Like hell it isn't, Rover stood to shout her down. We're the reason for this idiotic invasion. They've been drumming up hatred for us for years. They were doing that before we came down here. You're talking as if you were born an ant. We just got restructured. Did you forget? Beth Rain said calmly. Of course not. Robert glared at the two women. Besides, Larry put in, we can't go back. We have to go on. You're damn well right we can't go back. That should clap for silence. Intercorp has feared Antarctica for a long time, he said. We offer something intangible, a notion of freedom or individuality, a place where things are different. But most people don't want things different. Intercorp runs the world pretty well. There weren't many things you would have or do elsewhere in the world. You belong to a very small group of people who want to pursue a prescribed science. But perhaps some sciences should be prescribed. Many people believed in the last century that atomic energy should have been prescribed, that led to great evil. The sign equations might be the same. Certainly one of you, what you have done, is upsetting. What are you saying? We should let them invade us? We should run away? What are you saying? Sham asked. I'm saying, Thatcher said quietly, that you have to make up your own minds. We've expected this for years. Intercourt fears us because we exist. It's as simple as that. Eventually they would have come. We're ready for them. Because of their numbers, some will get through. But the problem as a whole is not so great. It truly isn't art your fight. Only stay if it feels right. He sat down. We should be going, Laren insisted. We shouldn't be sitting here talking. No, we should stay and help, one of the older women said. Isn't our programme important? Laren insisted. We're about to find a way to do what we've been dreaming of doing. Literally, literally dreaming it. There may not even be a terminus, someone said. There's a granddaddy storm out there too. We should stay. Yes, we should stay, someone else said. How many to go? Peter asked. Eight raised their hands. Stay? Eight again. They all looked at Peter, who turned to Thatcher. Is there a way out if it looks bad? Thatcher smiled. We'll find one. Then we stay. For a while. No more! <gasps> well, that was marginally exciting. There's more, okay. Well, I'll follow this track. The group moved as one through the corridors, pausing occasionally in storerooms to collect equipment and supplies. From time to time, they could hear voiced reports of the outside activity the computers monitored. The last transport was down and unloading. Suddenly, the floor shuddered briefly. What was that? Peter said. An earthquake? We prepared a little surprise at the southeast entry. Thatcher murmured, still moving swiftly and economically. They turned and he led them down a level. Laird and Titus were waiting there, ready for the outside. Let's get moving, 
you won't hold them for long, only make them a little more cautious. The group grew in size as they moved downward through the mountain. Grim ants with protective shielding were moving in small groups toward the various lower entries as well. I hear they've got a new kind of NP weapon, someone was saying as his squad trotted past. Killers. Yeah, the other said. I had that too, barbarians. This way, Thatcher said, branching into a side corridor. We want to avoid the main parties. Distant shouting grew louder as they descended into a service shaft, a stone tube with rough stairs spiralling the inside. Up through the open centre was a major conduit of the heat exchanger, a featureless black shaft that seemed to glow with some kind of negative light. They could feel the heat on their left sides as they jogged down the stairs. As they passed a landing, they could hear the spitting sound of NP weapons and an answering scream. They're using killers, Thatcher said. Okay. Um, is that... No? More? Okay. Peter stopped at a doorway and gestured behind him for silence. Thatcher was twenty metres down the corridor, checking a remote sensor panel. Peter slipped through the doorway. An air duct across the open space was sucking thick clouds of smoke that poured in from the chamber beyond. He turned and gestured the others in. Thatcher came up behind him. The explosion fried some of the circuits, he said softly. We don't know what's in there, but a small assault team got through. Well, let's try to avoid them, shall we? Peter moved on toward the smoke. We'll have to wear masks. They were sliding their breathing mask down when suddenly someone shouted. Peter dropped, bending both knees and sprang without hesitation. The sharp crackle of an NP weapon was followed by a scream. Peter saw Beth Rain go down. He was encumbered with all-weather gear and specialised equipment, so his manoeuvre was off-centre. The shape that loomed out of the smoke had stepped forward, NP weapon at the ready, when Peter landed beside him. The trooper, startled by this sudden apparition, swung the weapon. Peter stepped past the muzzle, pivoted on the ball of his foot, and picked up the momentum of the weapon with his palm. In a fraction of a second, he'd spun completely around with the weapon now in his hands. He tossed the weapon to Thatcher and chopped the exposed neck. The trooper dropped. Peter finished adjusting his mask and vanished into the smoke. Thatcher and the others waited against the wall. Thatcher kept the NP weapon pointed at the wall of smoke. Okay. Um, a little natty action scene to top us off? Yeah. Alright. Alright, so sort of retreating through combat. Well, I don't know quite where that leaves us for next time, but we'll um, we'll finish it for here. I think this won't be a little longer episode than usual. Um, but thank you very much for joining me. So, oh, no, I must remember to save. Let's do that. Go back to home and save. Here we go. I'll wait for it to load. And then we'll save. Yes, there we go. Yes, uh, thank you for joining me. And if you would like to uh, see what happens next, then please do subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below the video. And if you enjoyed it, uh, feel free to uh, give it a like. It will it will help the video and help the channel. Um, and until next time, everybody, take care. Bye bye.